is entitled Resisting Evil and the Devil, and how appropriate a lesson this is. Let me read to you from the book of Luke, the 22nd chapter for today. At the Last Supper, Jesus spoke to Peter and said, Simon, Simon, listen. Satan is demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prepared you for what your own, that your own faith may not fail. And when you, when once you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Here ends the lesson. Let us pray. Gracious God, this lesson is truly a pertinent lesson for the heartaches and pains of what this country is going through right now, at this very time. And so I'm asking that you help me to preach it effectively. And I ask that you would be in this lesson today. And that it would be a transformative lesson for those gathered here because I believe that every powerful transformation of our country to this world starts with a handful of people. And so may it start here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I mentioned to you this last week or two, last month or so, has been just such a tragic time for our country and the psyche of our country. And we just have seen a great deal of violence and death and murder at the hands of of people who are angry and upset for one reason or another. Oftentimes it's racially tinged. Uh, of course, in Orlando, it was tinged by this bigotry towards those that were that seemingly different, you know, against uh, against uh, our, our, our gay brothers and sisters. And, and, and this is wrong, because I am here to tell you that if the church should be known by any one thing, it should be by one thing alone, and that's about the love that we have for God and the love that we have for one another. And when we are not working on the side of love, we are working on the side of Satan. There is nothing else we should be known for. It shouldn't be our theological purity. It shouldn't be the fact that we've got all of our theology, theological ducks in a row. It shouldn't be what our belief systems are. It should be one thing, and one thing alone, and that's the love of God. And so we have crazy people running around in the name of God, murdering people and killing people, and this cannot be. We have people in the name of God, like uh, Hillsborough Baptist Church, that are going up and protesting at funerals of our soldiers who've sacrificed their lives. I'm sorry, that's evil and that's wrong. Anytime the church, in the name of Jesus Christ, is used in a manner that brings that type of heartache and harm to people, and the love of God is not seen in them, they are not working on the side of God. They're working on the side of hatred. They're working on the side of Satan. So today's lesson is really important because you need to understand who Satan is and you need to understand that evil is real and exists in this world. You've seen it. We've seen it this week. We've seen it the last month. And this is the stuff that takes place every single day in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and, and uh, all of these other countries, Ethiopia. We need to pray for each other. We need to be the people of God who stands up and says that we are on the side of God and on the side of God's love. So let's start with this. Let's look at our handout for today and who Satan is. I do believe, and I'm outright confessing to you, I believe that Satan is a real personal evil at work in the world, not just some malignant force like uh, a la uh, Star Wars, okay? You don't, have, you don't have the good side of the force and the bad side of the force. This is a real active being that's trying to conflict and uh, conflate the evil that takes place in this world. And the purpose of this devil, the Satan, is to stalk and ultimately destroy you, your life, and all of humanity. Isn't that good to know? We've got an opponent that seems very strong and hell-bent on harming you. He comes to steal, destroy, and kill. The Bible kind of makes a, a, an oblique reference to the fact that maybe this Satan was a fallen angel. We don't know. But we do know that we should never underestimate him and his angels because they're cunning, they're powerful, and they are evil. And they are out to get you. If it's ever felt like life is sometimes out to get you, maybe life is out to get you. Okay? However, Satan should never be given too much credit for things either. And so we look at the evils. Now what I mean by that, we look at the evil that's taken place in this week, and some people look at the evil that's taken place this last week with the deaths that took place in our country, 
And we say, oh, well, that's just evil. That's just Satan. It isn't Satan. Satan did not pull the trigger on those guns this week. Guess who did? It was a living, breathing human being. 99% of the heartaches that take place in this world are directly caused by human action, and we must take responsibility for it. We can't be like Flip Wilson. This is just for those two or three of us that are old enough to remember this. Remember what Flip Wilson said? The devil made me do it. You know, the devil doesn't make anybody do anything. When we do and perpetrate evil, we do it on our own behalf, in our own names. We are the ones that cause the heartache and pain. So we cannot blame the devil for the evil and the awful things that take place in this world. That's on us. But that doesn't mean that the devil isn't active. But let me tell you how the devil is active. He's not omnipotent. He can't do everything. So those people are pew dusters who come once a year. Those people who honestly go home at night. In fact, I can promise you this. If you just want to guarantee the devil's not going to have anything to do with your life, here's what you do with your life. You go out. You don't try to do anything nice for anybody. You just go home at night, turn on the TV, watch TV every day for the rest of your life. I promise you this, Satan's not going to waste his time with you. The people that Satan attacks are people who go out and try to do good things, to care for other people. And so I know you've done this, and you just, haven't you ever said this sometimes? You do something nice, and you get slammed for it, and you say, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Haven't you felt like that at some point? And in one sense, it's true, because... When you do something good, that's when you're going to get attacked. I promise you this. So if you're going to try to be the difference maker in this world, you're going to try to be a good person, you're going to try to bless people, you will come under a direct attack from evil because this is how evil works. Satan doesn't create the problems of this world, but what Satan does is Satan tries to attack you to get you unhinged so that you never do another good thing in your life. That's what Satan wants. He wants to discourage you so badly because you've been hit in the face every time you try to do something good. You say, I give up, and then Satan wins. As soon as you give up, Satan wins. That's Satan's job. So here's the techniques that Satan uses to stop you from being a good person and from working good in this world. He uses these following weapons. First of all, the weapon of doubt. Have you ever done something good and everybody's like, oh, that's spectacular, and then you do one thing wrong or you go in a little direction, and all you do is you focus on that one thing you did wrong. And it just takes a life of its own. It becomes bigger than the, all the good stuff that you do. I can promise you this. I believe that almost everybody here, and I believe most people are really good people and do a lot of great things, but we become so fixated on the few things that we've done wrong, we start to doubt whether we're even worthy or good people at all. So that's what, that's what Satan does. He wants you to doubt that. Satan tries to convince uh, you of what you cannot do. You're just not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're too this. You're too that. You're not enough of that. You're not enough of this. That's not from God. That's Satan trying to derail you so that you focus on what you can't do rather than your blessings. Let me tell you a mentality where you see this. People have got the lottery mentality. No, I think there's nothing wrong with playing the lottery. You want to play the lottery, fine. I don't do it. I think it's a waste of my, mo my money. But my grandmother always used to say she would play the lottery. She was 95, by the way. She'd always play the lottery once a week with the idea she wanted to benefit senior citizens. I'm like, good grief. Take the dollar, put it in your pocket. You'll benefit a senior citizen, right? But, um, you know, you got this lottery mentality of, oh, when I win the lottery, then I'm blessed, and then I can actually do something. And I'm like... You already have hit the lottery. Every single person here today and everybody watching on, online today, you've already hit the lottery. You want to know how I know that? Because you're alive. You've hit the lottery. You're alive. God has blessed you. You've got to get rid of this can't mentality, this negative mentality that says that you haven't been blessed. I think sometimes churches prey on that too. Those health, wealth, and prosperity churches, they prey on the fact that you just don't think you're blessed enough. You need a blessing from God. You've already been blessed. You don't need any more blessings from God. I mean, it's great when you do, but we live in this idea that we somehow lack, and that's what Satan wants to keep you in, this idea that you're lacking and you need more. Otherwise, you're not blessed. It keeps us from ultimately then from looking upward. I hope that makes some sense. I'm really passionate about this part. Of it. So the weapon of doubt. Letter B, the weapon of temptation. 
Now, temptation itself is not bad, but it's giving into those temptations. He attacks us in those places where we're weakest by denying the penalty of our sin and trying to convince us it's okay. <clears throat> he uses letter C, the weapon of fear. This is another one I see in a lot of members of our church. I've seen it in my family members. I have it in me as well. Satan wants you to doubt your value in Christ and to be fearful that God is going to come out and get you. And when you are fearful that God is going to get you, Satan's got you right where he wants you. He's got your value. But I'm going to tell you something that's really important. If you don't hear anything else today, this you need to hear. You have every single one of you marked on your forehead. You can't see it, but it's marked on your forehead, the cross of Christ. You've been marked. You've got a tattoo of God's cross, of Christ's cross on your forehead. God sees it. You've been claimed by God. You don't belong to anybody else but God. And when God puts his, the mark of the cross on your forehead and claims you as his own, he considers you as valuable as Jesus Christ himself. You've got the value of Jesus Christ on your forehead. How valuable does that make you? So you sit here, you doubt, and you wonder, am I worthy? Am I I'm no good? I'm this. Whenever you say those words, I'm, I'm not a value. I'm no good. I'm a bum. I'm an idiot. I'm this or that. Whenever you say that, you're devaluing the cross that Christ has put on your forehead, the claim that he has in your life, and the value that he places upon you. That's what Satan wants to do. And as soon as you buy into that type of stuff that Satan wants to sell you, that you're no good, you're a bum, that you doubt your goodness, you doubt your relationship with God, Satan wins and derails you and prevents you from being the person of light that God has created you to be. And so the consequences of giving into that negative thinking is shame, broken relationships with God, with the world, with each other, and ultimately bondage to Satan and sin. So I want to give you some tools today that you can use to defeat this negative mentality. Because again, Satan wants to derail you so that you are so you do not be a messenger of love in this world. But we as a church is imperative and we see the violence of the world today. We must be the beacons of hope for this world and love for this world. And so if we're going to be the beacons of love in this world, if we're going to be the people who bring love to a hurting and heart filled or heartache filled world. We need to defeat evil in our lives. We need to tell Satan no and get behind me and pay him the respect that Martin Luther used to pay to Satan. You know what Martin Luther used to do? He said every morning when he gets up, he turns and lets win Satan's face and lets him know how much he values him. Okay, think about that one for a little bit. It's a beautiful image. That's what you need to tell Satan every day. This is how much I value you, Satan. You got no place in my life. So what needs to happen is we Christians need to be transformed from the kingdom of darkness to light by the touch of Jesus Christ so that we no longer work for Satan and Satan is defeated in the cross of Christ. But here's the thing. While we believe that Jesus, that Jesus Christ has defeated Satan, that doesn't mean he doesn't have some bite. Any of you guys World War II buffs, you might know this about World War II. The British, the Canadians, the Americans, of course, invaded Normandy in June of 1944 and stormed the beachhead in France. And it took a while of fighting, obviously, but finally liberated France. By fall that year, the writing was on the wall. Germany was defeated. And so the, the Allies' push into Germany halted. Coming because the winter was coming, they said we can't invade Germany during the winter. We're going to wait until the spring, and so we all came to halt. And all the military men, all all the soldiers, were basically back behind the line, just kind of recuperating for a few months, doing some training. And then this German army that everybody thought was defeated did one last push. Do you remember what that push was called? It killed so many of our American soldiers and and the British soldiers and, and Canadian soldiers. It was called the Battle of the Bulge. It took place at the time that our men were just sitting back, relaxing, because they thought Germany was basically defeated. All we had to do now was walk into Germany. And so because they were not alert, our men were left out to dry. And thousands of them were killed. 
And so we have to realize while Satan is defeated by Jesus Christ, he still has a bite. And so we have to be careful by not giving in to the temptations and to the, to the words that Satan would tell us of who we are. We've got to stay away from Satan evil. That means staying away from whatever tears you down. So that's letter B. Let me use a good illustration. There are some of you, and I'm, please, I'm not critical of you by saying this. There are some of you who really like the uh, television show Breaking Bad, right? Got any fans of that? It's okay if you did. I, 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 people told me, you've got to watch this. This is a great show. I watched it for a while out of obligation to the friends who said it was just such a great show. But, you know, if you ever start watching that, there are no good characters on their show. There's no, nobody with any redeeming values. They're all so cynical and so hate-filled and such nasty characters. And I got after about a year of this, and I said, I can't stand this show. There's nothing worth watching this show for. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I don't like any of the characters. I finally just said, it's tearing me down. I turned it off. I said, enough's enough. I can't watch any more of this stuff. Now, like I said, if you find enjoyment out of it, good for you. I just found no enjoyment out of it. It was tearing me down. So I'm telling you, if there's anything like that in life that tears you down, maybe it's another person. Maybe it's a book that you read or music that you listen to that every time you listen to it, it just takes you from up here and brings you down to here. You need to get rid of that stuff and get it out of your life. Fill your life with goodly and kindly and godly things so that Satan has no foothold to get into your life. Letter C, how do you get rid of defeat evil? You devote yourself to your times of Bible study and prayer. We talked about that the last couple of weeks. D, stay in proximity to other Christians. You are here today so that you can be blessed by other Christians. You know, the most important thing that we do is not the sermon. It's communion. It's the hugging and kissing that we do of each other. It's the talking to each other before and after the service. That is the most important stuff that we do as a church because we're here to support each other to care for each other. No, you got a place where maybe the rest of the week, the other six days of the week, you go out there and it's just crap out there. You come here and people give you a big hug. That's what we're here to do for you. Stay in proximity to other Christians so that you can be lifted up and encouraged. And E, defend yourself against Satan's attacks so that you may not be torn down. This I encourage you to pick up the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and maybe that can be your devotional time this week. But this is what Ephesians 6, Paul says to us that we should do, is put on the, the belt of truth, okay? We need to put on the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace. Because after all, we're to be people of peace and love. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and ultimately we are told that we're not only to be on the defensive because we're carrying the spirit of truth, we are also supposed to be on the offensive. And so we are the ones that God is sending out in this world to put an end to the violence that has taken place. This is my last thing with this. In September, we are planning a prayer walk in East Pittsburgh, along with our partners up at New Day Ministries. We are going to walk through this community and we are going to claim it back for God. Actually, there's an old ancient Episcopal tradition where you would take a staff and pound out the boundaries of your, of your parish and basically say, Satan, you're not welcome here. So we are going to have a white pastor and a black pastor, white people and black people walking side by side. We're going to go down to the borough building and guess what we're going to do, or I should say the gymnasium, the police are going to be waiting there for us and we are going to anoint the police we're going to pray for the police. We're going to do that for EMS workers. And white and black, we're going to surround them and pray for their safety. And then we're going to pray for each other. Why? Because this is what the church needs to do. We need to be on the offensive against Satan and tell him that he's got no room here in our lives, in our homes, in our communities, in our country, and in our world. We need to be the people of peace. So if you're a messenger of God's peace and love, you're on God's side. If you're not, you're on Satan's side. <clears throat> Let us be on God's side today. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we come before you today knowing that you've called us to be on the side of peace and love. And we've seen such negative examples of that. But today, you know, I, I, I saw something incredible. And I really meant to share this. But, but uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter was on the air this week. God. And she was so amazing. She, I, just, I, just, I just love what she had to say. She talked about the violence that was taking place. And she said, my father always taught me that violence must never be met with violence, but with love. Because that is what God's work is. God, it so inspired me. She so inspired me, just like her dad inspired me, who I know was inspired ultimately by his relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, God, we must never, ever, ever, ever meet violence with more violence. But let us, your people, meet violence with love. So that Satan's work is not done, but defeated. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.